Hi, Sandy. How are you? I'm very well, Estella. How are you? I'm doing well. So thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for being here on on a holiday. What holiday is it in Canada? It is Victoria Day, um, also known as the Queen's Birthday. All so we, the Queen, yeah. we're, in, we're under the Commonwealth of England, so technically we celebrate the Queen's Birthday here. Okay. And you get a day off of work. That's cool. Yes. I, I actually took an extra day this weekend because uh, even during the pandemic, I've been full time. I haven't uh, been quarantined or anything like that. So I took Friday off as well. Uh, so I've been off for about four days now. Nice. So let's talk about work real quick. You are a technical writer for, am I right? Yes. Yep. And you do the road sign, like those digital road signs that we see? Yeah. Uh, like you're the in the morning uh, ahead, a avalanche coming. <laughs> uh, you know what? A lot of it is traffic. Man it's just basic traffic management. Like if there's an accident on the freeway or if there's a delay somewhere up ahead, you'll see these messages on the sign. I don't know if we've, I don't recall if we've sold, any, if we have anything in Arizona right now. So you may not, you may actually see our competitor uh, there. So you uh, do we, them for all over, not just for your area. I thought you just did them for your area, like you worked for your we, uh, city or whatever. No, we have customers in California. Florida's a big customer. Uh, West Virginia is a big customer. Uh, the South, Mississippi and Missouri are big customers. New York, uh, yeah, we're all over the U.S. And we do do Canada as well. We do, uh, we have some at the East Coast in Halifax and PEI and we have some here around Toronto as well. So nice. yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty widespread. Okay. Well, that gives me more of an idea of what you do. I thought you were, you know, just the local guy who inputs, <laughs> I don't mean to say just, but you know, who inputs all those funny messages that we see when we're trying to drive. And I, I don't know if you guys do that up there, but our messages are always funny, you know, like oh, really? to get your attention. Yeah. Yeah. No, once, once the signs leave our factory, the content that appears on them is out of our control. That's, That's out of your done. control. Yeah. The department of transportations and our ministry up here are the ones that uh, actually post the content. Right. We just okay. make it possible for them to do that. Cool. All right. So in your writing world, you write paranormal and fantasy. Yeah. I I, uh, you have the story you're reading for me now is criminal impulses. That's uh, near future science fiction. I have some epic fantasy on the go. I'm actually uh, sort of into urban fantasy right now. I'm working on a couple of different pieces that uh, sort of mix our world with the Fey world. So I'm, I'm kind of, excited to be working on stuff like that so dive into that tell everybody who doesn't know what what's the difference between urban fantasy and you know an epic fantasy that we might see from sanderson or so jordan or in an epic fantasy uh the world is typically 100 percent fictional right. so okay. it's if you take uh, game of thrones for example westeros is 100 percent fictional uh, fictional. It may have some roots in the real world, but it's there is nothing uh, there that you could map one to one to the real world. Uh, and urban, anything can happen, right? I mean, these are your um, this is your world, so you can make anything happen. People could fly. It's a bit or... of a generalization, but yeah, you if you wanted to write it like that, there are typically rules. Um, I know Brandon Sanderson. Uh, when he writes, he says all magic systems, one of his tenets is all magic systems have to have rules. So technically, yeah, you could have anything happen, but you have to have that suspension, that suspension of disbelief too, or, or in, and ground the reader. So while you can write whatever you want, if it's too uh, uh, off the wall, then you're going to lose your reader. So there has to be some, um, uh, it's hard to uh, hard to describe. It has to be some relatability to the way we actually behave and live as as society. Yeah, so yeah, I sense. can make it whatever I want, but if my characters aren't behaving like human or or something similar to that, then your reader's going to be confused and maybe a little bit pissed off or or not not keep reading you, right? So 
you have like any story, whether regardless of genre, you have to make it relatable. Right. Right. No, I, I completely agree. And we tend to give human characteristics to other exactly. beings as well. And that's what makes, you know, a, a story with just animals or aliens or whatever relatable so, because they have those human characteristics because that's what we know. But you know, do you feel, and then this is a, this is a probably a timeless question in fantasy. Do you feel like as a fantasy writer, you have to follow the general fantasy rules? So I think it was Anne McCaffrey, correct me if I'm wrong, who kind of colored the dragons based on good, uh, bad, whatever. Yeah, I, I don't know about that specifically. I, I'm not aware of that. Uh, like, like again, going back to genre, talking about genre, any, in any genre, there are tropes and, and, and conventions that are recognizable. So if I'm writing an epic fantasy and I don't have certain elements that are recognized throughout that whole genre, then um, I may lose readers. I may, uh, like, like, again, I may piss them off and they may put down the book and say, this is not what I was expecting when I picked it up. Right. That right. being said, you don't want to be so ingrained in a specific convention that you're becoming cliche. So uh, in the epic fantasy genre, there's the quest trope, right? So the hero leaves his home comfort zone. He's going on an epic quest. He's going to find the magic ring or do whatever. And you can still have that, but you have, can, you can twist it in ways that the reader hasn't seen. So while you're still giving them something that they recognize, you're also being fresh and original and giving them something that they may crave and haven't seen yet. Right. Okay. And in urban fantasy, you are in, in a more modern day world that we recognize rather than this created yeah. world building urban, world. That... In urban fantasy, you have direct links to this world. Now you can say, if I set a, a story in New York, right? there are going to be recognizable elements of New York. Right. But there's going to be an underlying element of magic or something fictional made up. Like this one piece I'm working on now, it's based around a cell phone app that where you can download magic spells and then use the magic that you download. So I'm sort of playing with a mystery, mystery element there. There's a, there's a missing person and a dead body and, this main character, she has to go and figure out why her friend is missing and why this dead body is around, and it leads to a whole, whole adventure for her. Very cool. So I just started getting into that one. I'm only about six, six and a half, seven thousand words into that yet, so it's still pretty, very much on the drawing board. But I'm excited about where it's going. Awesome. Is this the series that you were talking about in um, the graphics? We ran graphics on the Elizabeth River Press annual facebook page what on let thursday of last week um is that that series that you mentioned the the demon no, uprising series or no, is this something, something different, different. Uh, the demon uprising series is basically based around the dracula mythos oh and, okay um the premise of the story is uh, around a married monster hunting couple who sort of having some marital issues while they're trying to keep Dracula from being woken from his eternal sleep sort of thing so not only do they get the conflict from having to stop Dracula from being woken up they have all the things that surround a, a rocky marriage as well so hopefully I'm getting it getting it done well but I'll leave it to readers decide on that so how many pieces are you working on now how many novels are you working on now I have one two three, four, I'd say at least six that I have active that I've worked on within the past six months. I usually try to keep it to two or three at a time. I'm a type of writer that I lose steam easily. Yeah. So um, I can have great momentum for a couple of weeks on one piece and then I'll, I'll, I'll lose steam on that. So I'll jump into something else and work on that for a couple of weeks and then sort of yo-yo back and forth between a couple of different main projects but I, uh, I have a matrix a writing project matrix I call it and it's right now got 26 24 to 26 active pieces on it not all of the novels some of them short stories some of them novellas but uh, yeah I have about four or five I'd say active novels 
that's awesome. That's how I work too. And it, it frustrates me, <laughs> but that's well, I, how. I've, I've been posting a little bit on social media the last few days. Like I really got to get back to my main whip because it's, 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 people have read it already. They've given me feedback. So I've got to try and fix what they've noted for me so I can get it back out and hopefully submit it sometime this year. But when a new idea strikes, I'm, I'm sort of at the mercy of that right now. Yeah, that's cool. I, I get it. I have uh, manuscripts printed and piled up behind me with, you know, little post-it flags for editing mm -hmm. and in, in various stages of writing and rewriting and um, and I keep saying, you know, for the last couple of years, I've said I need to get this done and that done and then this done, and then I'll get back to writing for me. And it's it's constant. As an it's, example, uh, Criminal Impulses, which is what you're reading for me now, is about eight years old, maybe even older than that. Yeah. I've gone through five or six drafts on my own, sent it out for several different rounds of beta reads had it come back and made changes and cut and pasted and added where I needed to add. And I'm sending it back out again. I hopefully this time when I get it back from everybody, that'll be it. I can say it's done and then I can send it off to potential publish publishers and hopefully they'll pay me a lot of money for it. <laughs> <laughs> that would be cool. That would be ideal. I will tell you that most traditional publishers will, will change you know, some of what you love anyway, or they will ask you to change that, or an agent will ask you to change some of what you love. So I think even, sorry, that's my dog. Um, it's probably a butterfly or something. Um, I think even the most seasoned writers would, would say at some point, we have to learn to, to let it go and, yeah. and send it out into the world because nobody's going to read it other than, you know, your, your betas and, um, Nobody's going to read it, you know, shoved in a drawer somewhere. So I, I would say the, the first several things I wrote, I would rewrite today and change and would probably be better. Um, and I started to do that. And I was, what's the point? <laughs> just keep, just keep going, just keep going, keep growing, keep writing. Even, even today I opened up criminal impulses on my phone. Just, I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. I just opened it up and I, even on the first page, it's like, okay, I got to change that and I got to change that and I got to change that. So just rereading again after letting it sit for a couple months, I'm noticing, okay, I can trim that there. That doesn't really need to say that. It means yeah. the same if I reword it this way. Like, you know what I mean? It's, it's almost a never ending process. It's a big deal. Cold, cold reading is huge. I tell my clients when I edit, I tell them all the time, sit on it and then read it cold. You, I mean, don't just like sleep on it, like sit on it for, mm -hmm. like you said, a couple of months, because when you come back to it, it doesn't feel so fresh. You're not as emotionally involved. And when you read it, or what I always request of my clients is to have it read to them. So I always like pop it up into Word and have Word read it to you. And I always recommend read or have word read at a higher speed than you would read. So you have to keep up while you're visually scanning the screen. Um, and you're more apt to, to he hear the things that you don't like or to hear, you know, errors that you missed or that your betas missed. Yeah. Um, but having a cold read, I was talking to one of my clients today in advertising and I sent something yesterday and um, I wanted to send a, a, a client to the kind of a freebie based on, um, a TikTok trend. And so I was like, well, I, I just want to do this, but let me look at it because I wrote it yesterday. And that means today it would probably be completely different. And it was, I mean, just in 24 hours, I was like, yeah, I don't like that line. I'm going to take this out. I'm going to add this, I'm, you know, even in 24 hours, it was, it was changed. <laughs> so, I and, mean, and that's just ad pro, copy, you know? Pro, yeah, I understand. Uh, my process involves a lot of outlining a little bit and then writing and then going back and outlining a little more so even what I wrote last week or yesterday I could be thinking about it today and tomorrow and something will click and then I'll be like okay I've got to go back and rewrite that whole chapter now or yeah. even just on this cell phone app thing that I'm working on I changed the way two characters uh, appear like I gave the job of um, there, I have a magic shop owner uh, who was a separate character from my main character. 
but I'm I'm going to change it around so now that the main character is actually the shop owner and sort of changes the way the plot unfolds a little bit. So yeah, I'm going to do some rewriting there to, to, to incorporate that. So even it, it, writing for me is is a living. As it may sound weird, it's a living process because every day it changes a little bit from what I did yesterday and the day before and the day before that. I would completely agree with you. I think most most writers would. And it's a really cool moment when you have those those discoveries and you're like, oh, wait a minute, he needs to own the shop. <laughs> you know, like that, because then that will happen and then that will change this and that's what needs to happen. So th those are neat moments as, as a writer when you, you start connecting the dots that you thought were connected but weren't really tightly connected. Yeah, and I also like to outline backwards a little bit. So I'll, while it may not be the ending that I finish off with, I'll always have a few bullet points or maybe even half a scene drafted about the climax or the denouement, about what's going to be the last page. And then everything that happens in between, I can sort of semi outline and plot and get down my main ideas. And then if I end up pantsing stuff in the middle and, and I have to change a bunch of the outline, well, that's the way it goes. Yeah. And I've done that with a lot of different pieces. I've, I've outlined from chapter one to chapter end and the outline has changed well, countless times from when I started writing to when I end it. That's cool. So it definitely is a, a living, breathing, moving yeah. work in, in progress. Whenever somebody asked me about my outlining process and I didn't, and I never used to outline, like when I first started writing, I just wrote, like whatever popped into my head is what I wrote. I never had any concept of mapping out a plot or character or setting. Uh, I never had any concept of structure, like like the inciting incident or the midpoint or the, the pinch points. And none, I had no idea about any of that. And then I started reading. The, um, uh, and f actually educated myself on a lot of those different things. And now it's actually made me see the benefit of outlining. So while, like I said before, I don't outline from start to finish at the beginning, I'll outline, I'll have an idea of the major signpost scenes and I'll write them down. And they may even change by the time I get to the ending. But when I first start outlining, I'll have a little bit of an idea of what I want to happen in those signpost scenes. And then I'll start filling in the blanks in between. And I, that's, that's the way I write everything. I, I, I would completely agree with that as well. And I think, and I don't want to, to say this to offend anybody who's seasoned and, and doesn't outline, but I think for me, at least, I was the same way where I would just start writing and, and just pants my way through an entire novel. Um, and now I tend to plan a lot more. And I think speaking for myself, that comes from, like you said, learning more about the process and not just having a love of writing, but having a love of the craft and a respect for the craft of getting from point A to point Z at the very end of your story. Um, and there are a lot of different structures um, that, that I follow. I, I tend to follow more um, filmmaking structures, but um, I, I think that's a sign of writer maturity, if you will. Yeah. Not well, that I'm, seasoned writers I'm, have to plot and plan and outline, but for me, I think it speaks to how I've matured as a writer. Yeah. And the other thing is too, for me, is it changes based on the project. So um, Criminal Impulses, I, I think I pantsed a lot of it. And then after I got a first draft, then I did an outline and I based my revisions on the outline. Uh, sort of went through the whole thing, identified where I needed to add those structural points to make the story stand on its own. But it was only after the first draft was done uh, that I did that. Uh, with other pieces like this cell phone app piece that I'm working on, uh, I've outlined a lot of it up front, uh, at least the major points anyway, and then I'll write it and then I'll go back and then my revisions will be based on notes that I make as I've gone through the first draft. So some pieces I'll outline a lot up front, other pieces I won't outline until I've written a, a good chunk of it. Yeah. And you find those, those holes or those questions you have to answer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's cool. 
Um, you said in one of your questions that you start all of your drafts or you write all of your first drafts in longhand. Yep. That's got to be time consuming. It, yeah, it is. Um, I know you're a part of the 10 Minute Novelist group as well. So uh, I take that uh, theme uh, maybe a little bit further than I should because I'm not a person that can sit for three or four hours at a time and just hammer out on a keyboard. I, I can't do it. I, like I said before, I run out of steam and that's not yeah. just on a piece, but like on any given day, I can write a half a page or uh, even a couple pages at a time. And then I got to take a break. So what I do is normally I'll draft everything in a notebook or, or on a few sheets of paper that I have handy. And then when I go and type it up, that's my first draft edit. That's my first pass edit. And I'll fix obvious stuff. Obviously, there's going to be more uh, when the whole thing is done. But I, I have to work in small chunks. That's And that's where a lot of that comes into. The other thing is, I, and I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just my mentality. I, I connect to a story a lot differently when I'm writing longhand than I when, when I'm working on a computer. I see the story a little bit more organically when I'm actually writing with a pen and a notebook. I don't, I can't explain it any better. Than I, that. I think that makes sense. I think that um, if you think about um, you study, study guides, uh, high schoolers, you, you've got kids, right? Um, yeah. they, they say that if they, I don't know who they is, you know, professionals, brain people, teachers, whatever, um, that if you handwrite your notes for students, they're more apt to remember all that yeah. um, information rather than if they, you know, type it up or dictate it in their class or just record their, their lecture from their teacher. Um, I, I think, you know, like you said, you're, you're more connected to it and it, it kind of lives with you a little bit longer. For me, I think I would, my brain goes so fast and I have really bad ADD. I think <laughs> I would, I would forget what I was going to say. Like I would have it in my mind, like, okay, three paragraphs down, I'm going to do this and handwrite it. I'd be like on sentence two and I would forget what I was going to do in three paragraphs if I had to, if I chose to handwrite mm -hmm. things. But I do, I, I do composition books um, and I handwrite a lot, but I don't handwrite scenes like that. Praise to you for having the, the patience to do that. <laughs> oh, sometimes the patience runs out and I do jump on the computer and I'll just, if, if, uh, if I get a spark that the scenes really come into me, and I got to get it written down. Then occasionally I will jump on a computer and I'll just be typing away. But uh, when I'm, especially, especially when I'm brainstorming, uh, like I do almost zero brainstorming on a computer. It has to be in a notebook. It has to be on a I, I do that too. Yeah. Where it, I'm writing stuff down as they're coming to me. And I'll, I'll have pages on my lap or on my table and I'll be flipping back and forth. I'll be making a note on page seven or I'll jump back to the outline or the, the story Bible and I'll make a note there or I'll jump to the ending. If a piece of the ending comes to me and I'll make a note there. Like um, when I'm writing scenes, I tend to write linear, linearly when I'm outlining or when I'm brainstorming, I'm all over the place. I like I index cards on, on like the dining room table. You know, so you can yeah. move the right. It's same same concept in Scrivener and and Scapple. And I love Scapple, but I have to do it on on paper, like you said, and then transpose it to to Scapple. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's cool. But longhand, that's impressive to to write that much. I mean, I you know, I um, I do notes and stuff, but there's I just yeah. that's a lot. That's a lot. Um, getting, oh God, sorry. Sorry, I was gonna say my wife's getting no annoyed with all of the binders I have lying around with. <laughs> <laughs> wait until you start putting index cards on the dining room table and then tell everybody not to touch and you can't <laughs> eat here either <laughs> don't move anything um you mentioned brandon sanderson is one of your favorite authors you had a long list and i'm sorry i don't remember them all um you're welcome to to say more i i brought up sanderson for a couple of reasons my last interview that I did, I don't know if you saw it, was with um, Cassisi Harris and Sanderson was his favorite as well. But he didn't, I think, if I remember correctly, didn't know of Sanderson's work um, as a part of Robert Jordan's work or Sanderson before Robert Jordan. He knew of Sanderson from his YouTube channel and all the great mm -hmm. things that he does for writers. Um, but it sounds like you also listed Robert Jordan 
Um, so I'm assuming you you know their connection and you you know. I actually didn't uh, discover Brandon until I found out he was finishing real time for Robert Jordan's estate. Yeah. And then I, they made they made the announcement, and I'm looking, who the hell is this guy? Who is that? <laughs> So I looked him up and then I picked up his book Warbreaker, which is sort of a state like he everything he writes is sort of a part of the same universe, but not really like it's a different parts of the same universe. He call he calls it the Cosmere. So there's elements from everything across that he writes that appears in each each of his work. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very subtle in a lot of cases. But uh, once I once I figured out who he was and I started reading him, it was like a light bulb went off. It's like holy crap, this guy's amazing. This is so, cool. Yeah. Um, I re I've read so far uh, Warbreaker. I've read his the, the stuff he did to finish off Wheel of Time. Uh, he's writing now a fourteen book series called The Stormlight Archive. I've read the first two books of those of that series, and I have the third book uh, sitting on my to be read list. Uh, but it's about 1,200 pages long, so it's going to be a while. Um, his Mistborn series, I've I've read a, a bit of that. So yeah, I've uh, he actually came to Toronto a few years ago. I uh, can't remember exactly what year it was, and I drove about an hour and a half just to meet him. Oh yeah. I took my teenage son, and we drove out from my home uh, in on the western part of of Toronto all the way across to the eastern part of Toronto. Uh, where he was and I sorry to say I had a complete fanboy moment and kind of bit my tongue and was just like oh my god oh did you walk away thinking oh, I wish I, I had that was just the most terrible thick encounter I've ever had but <laughs> I think we've was, all was, had those moments we've all yeah. had that <laughs> he came here and uh, uh, he was on tour for his uh, novella uh, called The Emperor's Soul and well, if, you, if you've researched Brandon Sanderson at all, you know he doesn't write short works. Every, almost everything he's written is, like, it's epic. It's right, right. Maybe the three to 400,000 words long. And that's one book. Uh, he wrote this little tiny novella. It was about, I don't know, 30,000, 40,000 words and had one or two characters in it. And hearing him talk about it on his podcast, Writing Excuses, it's... it's it, it, it floored even him that he could write something that short. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'm playing, struggling to get stuff out too. <laughs> and imagine going on tour for a novella. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, I'm just here for my 30,000 word piece. Yeah, oh, I know, I know. I, so I mean, imagine being that person who, you know, people are- he wrote it on a plane on the way back from Korea or Taiwan, something like that. He wrote it on a plane. He wrote a 30,000 word novella on a plane. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I do it all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know why. I just, I'm just waiting for my next flight. Like I opened <laughs> up your book on a plane and I still haven't finished reading it. It's not because of your book. It's because of my time. But I, I had these big aspirations when I got on that plane. I was like, hey, send me your book because I'm going to be on, like, on a five hour flight twice. So I'll get through it. And I didn't. And then I still haven't. Um, but it's good. So if that means anything to you, it's just, I just need oh, time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I liked it. No, I, I will tell you the opening was very exciting. I mean, that was, that was movie, you know, that was action packed and it, that was exciting. It was definitely attention grabbing. So that, that's actually the first book that I've shared with anybody else to read. So yeah. like it's actually the first novel. I, I mean I've written and finished other novels that went nowhere. They they were terrible. I, I didn't even revise them because they were that bad. Uh but this is the first book that I've actually written start to finish and re I've read like I said, I did like five drafts before I even sent it to the first set of beta readers. And it took me a long time. I was a very self conscious writer for a long time. I wouldn't share anything with anybody. And it got to the point where, like, if I really wanted to do anything with this uh, career, I'm going to have to grow a pair <laughs> and, <laughs> and share my work because it's, that's the only way you're going to improve is if you get that feedback. It's true. But I will also say that it's a scary world out there. It and is. you know what? I'm not afraid of a bad review. 
I don't like the petty crap that I see on Twitter. I don't like people making fun of people. Mm, I don't I, like, I, I, don't I mean, the, I, just the cruelty. That's... Yeah. Uh, I did get one one beta read on criminal impulses when it was still in its earlier stages that, uh, I mean, it stung, it stung, but the, the feedback that was being presented to me made sense. And I took a lot of the advice to heart and I made the changes that were being suggested. But the, the tone and some of the language of the comments that I got, uh, it was like a bit of a whip because, uh, I mean, you don't expect somebody to talk about your work that way, whether yeah. it's warranted or not. So, I mean, it took me a while after I got that beta read to, to really get back in and dig into the, the, the story and, and try and make it better. And now, like, I know when I send a piece out, it's going to come back with negative feedback at some whether it's my narrative whether it's a character issue that i have to address or whether it's setting or whatever uh, i can't get it right the first time i'm not that kind of writer i have to do multiple and everybody every writer is similar i haven't met a writer yet that can't that has that can get it right the first time but uh knowing that no having that realization that you're, <laughs> you're sending it out with knowing that you're going to get feedback on it and it's not going to be all good uh, yeah as enabled me to get past those blocks where now I can go in and I can address stuff that makes sense for me to change that doesn't mean I still agree with everything that's being uh, said about uh, a particular work but um, I know enough now where I can pick and choose what feedback I, I take and hopefully that first feedback that comes back is constructive enough that you can learn from it and, and change you know it's what you it's what we need so negative feedback is okay if we're learning from it and growing from it and we're willing to say oh yeah you know you're right this is probably what I should do or or that's okay that you think that but I'm going to keep it this way and I'm comfortable with that when, when I send out a, a book or a piece now for a beta read I, I sometimes I'll send a list of questions and on the first page of my questions, I have two rules. Rule number one, you're allowed to tell me you don't like it. Rule number two, you're not allowed to tell me you don't like it, but you, you have to tell me you have to tell me why. Why, yeah. You can tell me you don't like it, but you have to tell me why. Because if you don't tell me why you're having issues with the story, I can't fix it. Yeah. So my, my goal is to make it make the story as good and as uh, appealing as possible so people will read it. Yeah. If, if you take it and there's issues and you're having, you don't really think the character's a jerk and you don't want to read about them anymore, then uh, like, if I don't know that, I, I can't address it. That, that That's where I go with it. I completely agree. It's got to be helpful. You know, tell, telling you, oh, I don't like it because I don't like urban fantasy. That, that's not helpful. Doesn't do don't, me any good. don't read it. <laughs> don't read okay. it, but don't tell me it sucks because you don't like the genre. <laughs> yeah, don't. The, the only thing that tells me is okay then then you're not a beta reader that that I need to engage anymore because this isn't going to be helpful to me and it's not going to be enjoyable for you so great right. it, it's useful that you tell me that you don't read beta, uh, urban fantasy because okay I'll seek other avenues that would be more useful to me in that, in that particular area yeah like I've had yeah. people read criminal impulses that don't read uh, science fiction. Uh, the feedback I got was less than useful. So yeah. it is what it is at that point. I just, okay, I make a note. Don't, don't engage that particular reader for science fiction anymore. Maybe yeah. they'd like some of my paranormal stuff, or maybe they'd like some of my urban fantasy or whatever. Do you have any paranormal published? Well, True I stories have, or anything? Well, you have Fear of the Moon. I, I kind of, it's werewolves and stuff. So I kind of, group that in paranormal a lot of right. people there's a bit of a blurred line now between what's called fantasy and what's called paranormal anything uh, with demons or vampires or werewolves i i sort of loop into paranormal um so and that one's I, in in the annual so yeah. that one that one's going to be released on the second next month in the annual yeah right yeah <laughs> I do too. Uh, we're still waiting for proofs and we're hearing that proofs are behind. So, uh oh, that's not good. I know. Oh. Pandemic. 
stuff, you know. <laughs> I know. And we're actually starting to um, lift some of our restrictions here, but I think it's a bit too soon, but that's a whole nother. We are too. We are too. Arizona is open for business and I'm, oh, really? I'm really thankful that I work from home. Yeah. So, so uh, going back to what I have published, I, my very first actual publication that wasn't through a friend or uh, wasn't through a novelist or anything like that uh, was a straight up ghost story about a recovering alcoholic and a haunted lighthouse. And that, that's probably, I think, not, not to brag too loudly, but I think that's still one of my better works. I yeah. uh, still get a lot of uh, positive comments on that one. People who read it say they really enjoy it. Um, I didn't outline anything of that. I, I wrote it, um, got some feedback on it, addressed the feedback, and, and submitted it. Actually, the very first place I submitted it to accepted it. So it wasn't nice. even rejected once. Um, so I had that one. And then paranor the other paranormal-ish one I have, I just published it myself on my website. It's called... Uh, hot under the collar um that's about a demon wrangler with anger issues and a potty mouth so nice. <laughs> if, if you can't handle a little bad language you might not want to read that one no read that one and that one's on your website and you just launched that's your website, website like two weeks ago right uh april 27th so yeah that's about three weeks, three, three three weeks, weeks ago. ago yeah well, yeah yeah okay so, yeah, let's talk social weeks. media real quick um because you have your new website um, you have said that most of your social media um, interactions are on Twitter, but you have a Facebook page as well, right? And all this is in um, in your graphics that are up on the Elizabeth River Press annual Facebook page. Um, but wherever I post this, I'll try to post those links as well so people can follow you. But you have a Facebook page. Yeah. Do you do do you interact on Facebook as often as you do on Twitter, or um. are you on Twitter more? Uh, oh, I'm on Twitter more just because it's a quicker medium to respond. Like I can hammer out a tweet to a question in a, in a, a minute, less than a minute. So if like I I there's a hashtag going on Twitter right now. It's a hashtag writing community. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a lot of different, a lot of different levels of writers too. Not just uh, beginners or or sort of just getting into it. But there's a lot of established writers with multiple publications to their name that uh, interact on this this hashtag. So you'll see a lot of craft related questions that I that I answer. Like I love talking about writing. Like I love talking about the technicalities and the nuts and bolts of it. I'll talk yeah. about my stories too. But that I mean, talking about my stories seems a lot of times a little bit less interesting than actually talking about the act of writing and 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 the process of writing. So, um, yeah, I love that stuff. Tw uh, Facebook page, my Facebook page is sort of wallowing a little bit. Uh, it's only at 350 some odd followers right now. And I post when I have either something funny or stupid to say, or <laughs> if I have, uh, if I have an announcement, like if I'm coming up with a new piece or something like that, or sometimes I'll share uh, snippets of what I'm working on. Like I'll post That's a paragraph cool. or two. Uh, yeah, I'll post a paragraph or two of my, my whip and it'll be very raw. It'll be like first draft material, but usually gets the most interactions on my page. But yeah, uh, a lot of the times it's Twitter. A lot of, and actually there's a lot of interaction on my personal account, my personal uh, Facebook account. Because I um, I'm friends with a lot of different uh, writers from a lot of uh, different regions as well. So um, that's awesome. So yeah, I, I'm I'm all over the place. You can you can find me pretty much anywhere. Anywhere. I'm even on well, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say I'm even I'm even on LinkedIn and Instagram, but I don't use those platforms as much as I do Facebook and Twitter. I was gonna say that the hashtag writing community is also popular on LinkedIn and Instagram and even TikTok. Um, I mean, it's, it's everywhere. Not one I've investigated yet. I'm TikTok hearing a lot is, of is fun. Um, I it's fun. That's all it is. It's fun. Um, although I will say that I think Rachel Peterson is her name. She's um, in branding, social media, marketing. 
um, has um, kind of developed a way to monetize TikTok, even though it's not something like YouTube that you can monetize. But yeah. um, she's taken her brand and other brands on TikTok and, and pushed them into other platforms where they can be monetized, but they build their audience on TikTok, which is really cool. Uh, I don't think that that's really what I'm doing, but it's it's a really fun place to be. If you haven't been there and you think that it's a 14 year old, you know, musical dance platform, just you know, make an account and just scroll for a couple of days and just watch before you even engage. It's it's a lot of fun. It's what Facebook I think used to be when we had fun. And Lovely. now, I mean, I don't know about you, but I do business on Facebook all day long, and so when I go to do personal stuff, I'm like. Ugh. <laughs> you know, like, to, be, to be honest with you, the current the current climate, both politically and socially, right now, is turning me off of a lot of different things. There's a lot of stuff on Facebook that I just it, it works me up. It really does work me up. But I've got to be like I've tried to be careful. It's like I should I shouldn't respond. I shouldn't respond, and I'll maybe type out a message, and then it's like oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I do that a lot and, and I delete a lot more than I used to where I'm like, oh, I'm going to do it. And then I'm like, oh, no, just just keep scrolling. It's not worth it. It, it It's just so energy sapping and it takes yeah. so much time out of a day where I don't have a lot of time anyway. Uh, because we're like between my personal writing, my fiction and the day job and then home life and all that stuff. It's just it. By the time when I leave my house at eight o'clock in the morning, eight thirty, and then by the time I get home at six thirty, I'm just usually so drained. I just don't have the energy or the time to engage with that crap anymore. I just I either stay off it altogether, or I'll just scroll past, and it's like, yeah, it's not even worth it. Yeah, scroll past. That's it. I think it's taken me a lot to to get to that. Just keep scrolling because it's even if they're friends, it's just not worth it and then like you said there's no energy at the end of the day and then you're giving what little you have to somebody yeah. who's not going to listen to you not going to care and probably just argue with you and tell you how wrong you are anyway so yeah. it's it's uh I mean, it's I've, not a I've fun place to be yeah i've unfollowed people on facebook just because it's you know what you can you can have your opinions believe what you want I don't want anything, any part of that. So I'm just, you know what? I'm just going to disconnect from it all together. And yeah. you can keep posting, but it doesn't mean I have to see it. Yeah. Well, you and can block people block for 30 people. days. Yeah. It's one of those things where I, it's unfortunate that you have to do it because, uh, it, but like, it's like I said before, I just don't have the, the energy for it. And you're not going to change, like you said, you're not going to change their mind anyway. So what's the point? You're not, it, and I'm a, I'm a big advocate for different opinions. I am totally cool if we don't align politically. I think that's actually really good because then I have a chance to learn from you or, you know, whoever, um, or if we don't agree on something, I am, I am all for that. I'm all for, you know, being open to learning why you think this way or, you know, why this belief is this way and having an opportunity to, to change my mind or, or at least grow. But I feel like so even my personal friends, you know, so many times people are, are not interested in that and, and are more interested in drilling down to you have to agree or you're or it's insulting. You have to agree or you're an idiot. I mean, that's basically the message that I feel like I get most of the time. I'm trying to plug my phone in. I'm, my battery's dying. Uh, uh, yeah, no. Um, the one thing I, I, I can say is uh, partisan politics for me is just um, it's 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 useless because yeah. a lot of times but whatever party you follow, whatever party you support, if there's an idea that's that's going to solve a problem and it comes from the other side of the aisle, it's never going to pass because, well, OK, it's a great idea, but because you're whatever party we're not going to agree to it yeah. so like we're we're right now under a, a more liberal government in canada uh, but the conservatives like to make a lot of noise but there there are issues that we have and it's the same in the u.s as well but that can be easily solved if the both main parties were would just 
get off of the partisan horse for a little while and sort of work it out. You know what I mean? And and yeah. that's and I guess you could call that more of a center uh, centralist uh, opinion, but it's just it, it's really asinine for me to listen to both even both even the party that I sort of lean towards listening to them try to justify what they're doing is sort of like well okay great stop talking about it and just do it or do it, yeah. if you got a opposition to that particular idea go and engage with the other the other leaders or the other parties and work it out like this is I'm a citizen of this country this is my life you're affecting. It's the life of my kids and the life of my wife and my other family members. It's like, you don't realize the impact that you're having by fighting over, and a lot of times it's stupid crap. Like it's, it's stuff that you could solve 10 minutes in a room. I but anyway, that's, 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 my, that's my political rant for today. I'm <laughs> No, I, I, I agree. I think everybody needs to, you know, you take a step to the left to take a step to the right and let's meet a little closer to the center and then have some dialogue. And then we'll, you know. Like I like to look at it this way is there are ideas from the liberal side that I agree with and there are some that I don't. There are ideas that I agree with on the conservative side. There are some that I don't. That like there should be a way to make it to, to, to mesh them together and make almost everybody happy. Well, making everybody happy is impossible, but you know what I mean? You should be able to at least appease the majority of the population by sort of weaving the two, two scenarios together. I don't know if I'm making any sense or not. No, I think it's, you are. I mean, I think most of us, at least here in America, most people that I know are very middle of the road. We, yeah. we all have, you know, ideas on both sides and ideals and, and values that that align with our lives, our personal lives, our families, our careers, you know, whatever. And you, you can't tip one way or the other because something's going to be affected by the other side, whether it's healthcare or taxes or, you know, for me as a gay woman, gay rights. Um, yeah. I, but I'm very conservative in a lot of ways and I'm very liberal in a lot of ways. And, and yeah, it's I, never I think really most of us are middle of the road. I, th I think a lot of the problem is people deal too much in absolutes and it's never an absolute. There is yeah. always a gray area. Like you said, you're passionate about equal rights for the gay community and diversity and those things, but in an, like maybe in financial areas or other other uh, situations you'd be a little bit more conservative on the same way like i don't like to see my tax dollars wasted but also don't want to see social programs like autism funding or uh equal rights for uh people of color and and our lgbt community like i don't want to see those programs cut either so there's got to be a middle ground somewhere yeah that's where there I, is that's there my, is. The politicians my just aren't willing. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, down here, it's it's an election year. And of course, with the pandemic, you know, we don't know what we're doing. And it's already May. It's already mid-May. And, yeah. you know, like, I don't even know, I don't even know what's going to happen in November. I don't know if we're going to have direction or not by then. It, whether I've seen, I've seen online that uh, some states are allowing mail-in voting. I've that, always done mail-in voting. I mean, I honestly think since I could vote, I've always mailed it. Well, I can think of twice I've gone to a poll, but I've lived in three or four states and I've always mailed in. So, yeah. so is, that, know, and, is that just some states don't want to, are they paranoid about conspiracies and things like that? Honestly, that they don't I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> I've heard different <laughs> things over the years that, my mail-in ballot doesn't count unless something happens and then they count the mail-in ballots. And then I've, you know, read the rules that say it, it, it counts. It's, it's no different than any other ballot. This is just, as long as it's postmarked and received by the state, then it, it goes in with all the rest. And, um, and, and this was even before this year that I had heard that. I was like, are you kidding me? That's, I've always done it this way. I mean, it was always a, an, an option in Colorado where I lived before. And I'm pretty sure I did it in Virginia. 
not sure that I voted in Massachusetts. I don't know if I was there during an election year, but anyway, um, I feel like I've only been to the polls a, a couple of times in all the years that I've been able to, to vote. Yeah. And it's convenient and, you know, we get our, our ballots like in June or July and, or, or maybe it's August, maybe it's June or July for the August elections, maybe it's August for November, but you get them super early and you decide and you ship it off and it's, you know, it's, it's just off your mind. You don't have to worry about it. So I, I don't know. It's always something every four years. It's something it's, we need IDs. No, we can't take IDs. That's discrimination. We need this and no, we can't have that. It's, you know, it's always something. So. <laughs> So my my dog. Yeah. <laughs> she, Stop talking politics. Yeah, is that what she's telling us? Be quiet. My daughter actually mm -hmm. just walked in. I think she's like, oh, she's here. Somebody's here. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have a Saint Bernard that sleeps like right at my feet all day long, and he pushes my chair. So some days I'll just go flying. <laughs> I, I have a cat. It's actually my daughter's cat. Called. She's named her Blueberry Muffin. But if, if you don't hear this cat at some point during the day, you better go looking for her because she's either running up and down the hall screaming like a mad cat or she's curled up. I think she's curled up on the dresser right now asleep. Oh, so that's it's actually sweet. peaceful here right now. <laughs> because she's sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> three in the morning. It's, all, it's a lovely at three in the morning when yeah. you leave her, the bedroom door open a crack, she'll knows her way into the bedroom and jump up on the bed and she'll be like wow screaming at the top let me sing you this song to my people i used to have a cat who would in the middle of the night find socks like out of the dirty clothes and then just carry a big sock around in his mouth like he had caught something <laughs> big and he would just you know all night long <laughs> yeah um so anyway i i think i've kept you a, a a lot longer than I, I always talk for a long time. Um, so I've kept you longer than I had planned. Sorry. That's all right. Um, I actually have to go for, out into the rain now. You have to what? I have to go out into the rain now. I got to go pick up my travel trailer. It's getting close to camping season. Into the rain. We don't, yeah. and we have a, we have a monsoon season here. So we allow rain like, you know, a couple of days a year. <laughs> We're into actually April and May are usually our uh, our wet months. Like it's once the snow melts in late March, early April, then the rain it's war it's warming up enough where it's it's not snowing anymore. It's raining. It's raining. Yeah. By by the time June first rolls around, it's we're into 25 degrees Celsius, which is nice shorts weather, um, and it's it's perfect for taking the trailer out for the weekend. That's awesome. So you have to go deal with that now in the rain. Uh, I'm going to, uh, she, I'm, we've stored her at a friend's place right now, but they're uh, in the middle of uh, a couple of things at their house. So they've asked if we can move her out for a few days so they can take care of what they have to take care of. And then we'll put her back probably in a week or so. Good deal. So I'm hoping that they go next month to the private campgrounds are supposed to open if they're not already supposed to open sometime in the next couple of weeks so we're open to be able to go in june for a for at least one night maybe two depending on how it goes that would be nice and camping you know with your own family or even with close friends is isolating so no reason why you can't do that yeah well, that's fun um, what was i gonna say okay oh yeah when I'm like when I go camping, it's it's a, a part of the creative process for me as well because, like, if I'm out in the woods and I'm just there's no noise except for the voices in my head that sometimes never shut up, <laughs> uh, then I can I can work out plot problems. I can figure out what I'm uh, having issues with a character or anything like that. So I actually use it to to help my writing as well. So. I like it. That That's way. awesome. Clear head. You're not thinking about all the stuff you have to do at home. You're not thinking about work. You're not thinking about all the chores and yeah, that's awesome. Good deal. Well, thank you for being a part of the Elizabeth River Press annual 2020. Um, if you were with us early on, I appreciate your patience because it's taken, it's taken me a long time to get this thing off the ground and 
um, that was just a result of life. So thanks for your patience. I'm excited to see it finally uh, in print and come to fruition. And I know there's a lot of different great, uh, great writers uh, besides myself in there. So I'm looking forward to actually reading what others have submitted as well. So. Yeah, I'm really excited about several of them. Um, so, there's, there's so much good stuff in there. I think we have 34 of, of us. I, I have one of my pieces in there. Too, so. I see there's a lot of poetry in there too. There is a lot of poetry. It's a good split. I thought we would have more poetry than prose. And um, I mean, honestly, I'm not a poet. Um, my mm. business partner, Charles, is a poet and I usually edit his poetry books. Um, but I'm not into poetry. So I had this fear when we started this that we would end up with a book of poetry and which would have been okay. But it, I told Cassisi, like, those aren't my people. So it's great. So we have some great poems and some really thought provoking stuff. Um, but I like stories. I, I, I like prose. And I even opened it up to um, short film scripts, but we didn't get any. So maybe next time. Is this uh, an annual thing? Are you going to do this annually or are you going to do it biannually or what, what's your plan for going forward? If you don't mind my asking. I don't, I don't know. Uh, so here's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do a magazine and I wanted to do like a quarterly magazine. Um, so we would have a quarterly magazine out four times a year. And then my thought was at the end of the year, we would kind of take the best of the best from those magazines and then publish a book in the spring of the following year from, from those pieces. Um, because it took me so long to get my stuff together, I was in school. Those last six months of school were a lot more grueling than I had. Thanks. Um, it was a lot more grueling than I thought. I mean, it was, you know, school is school, but I'd gone through like two years of it and it was, it was time consuming, but it was okay. And it was a breeze and it was cool. And then I just thought, well, this, next six months it's gonna be nothing and the last six months were really time consuming and crazy and then you know I had a couple of vacations in there and just some life stuff happening my daughter was hospitalized twice and I just had all kinds of just stuff so I couldn't I, I couldn't take all the pieces that we had and turn it into a magazine because we just had we had so much and I couldn't say no to to people that I, I adored so um so we decided to do a book this year. If we do it this way, I, I can't see us doing it more than once a year. So it will be once a year. Mm -hmm. If we decide we have the time, I would love to get back to the idea of a quarterly magazine, online and print. Um, maybe, you know, a little, a mix of both. So if you want yours online, we can do online. If you want it in print, we could do it in print and then take in the best of the best and make an, uh, an annual book out of it. So the one that's coming out June 2nd, is that, uh, online only or is it a hard copy? No, it's a or? it's a print book. It, yeah, it'll be a it'll be paperback, um, but it's a print. And we actually talked about going hardcover, but we have everybody's photo in there and that's really expensive to print. So I don't know about you. Um, as a writer, you might want a hardcover, but I can't see many of even our writers buying a hardcover just to get their piece. And I don't see I the audience buying a hardcover. <laughs> What's that? I said I'm happy just having something with my name on the cover. Right, right. It's it's just more expensive to to print, and it's two hundred and sixty something pages. So, um, we we were just thinking about cost. It would be more expensive to to do hardcover. I have two short uh, two stories printed with a small publisher uh, named Cloak Press, mm -hmm. and they um to get my books printed and shipped to me. Uh, to order 10 copies is like a hundred over a hundred bucks, like $120 Canadian for me to wow. buy, have 10 books printed and shipped to my home here. It's crazy expensive. And that's hard. And that's, that's not even hard covers. That's uh, trade paperbacks. That's so, yeah, crazy. I understand, I understand the expense completely. And it's, it's not, it's not him that the publisher that's setting that cost it's Amazon and their, their printing service. And, than UPS or, or the, the postal service having to ship it across the border into Canada. So it's, it's, it's expensive. So yeah, I understand completely where you're going. Yeah. From. Wow. That is crazy. Um, yeah. So it cost, you know, and then it was a third ISBN. So we just, we decided to, to not do hardcover and Charles does 
most of his books in hardcover. He just sent me uh, his latest poetry book and it's massive. I mean, it's it's a big hardcover book. And and I think his retail price on it is like 50 bucks. I'm like, I just, yeah. I don't think we have the audience for short stories and, and small poetry pieces to mm-hmm. sell a hardcover. I just, I, I, you know, I wanted this to be fun and a place for, for new writers and seasoned writers to go to, to, to build a portfolio and to say, you know, while I'm writing my six novels, I have a piece here and I have a piece there and a piece here. And, and it's, it's got to be. I do like to work that way, too, is I'll work on the novels. And then if I get an idea for a short story, I'll put the novels aside and I'll sort of palette cleanse a little bit with a with a shorter piece. That's how a lot of the short stories that I have published have come about. Like I've been working on something longer and then I'll get the spark about something and I'll go, OK, I'm going to take a couple of weeks or a month and I'll write a short story get it polished and submittable so yeah that's cool that's the way to do it i i started this idea in 2018 when i was in school and i was in school with a bunch of younger kids um because this was me going back to school after i went the first time a long time ago and i'm not new at writing and i'm not new at submitting and i'm not new to rejection or you know accepting work and i'm not new to publishing but most of them were and it was discouraging to see so many young writers get uh, upset or discouraged it was discouraging to see them discouraged um and i'm a writer (laughs) um it, it was sad because you know we we would submit for each class and then so many would get accepted and so many wouldn't and you could just see them Kind of falter in their confidence of their own writing and these are good writers um yeah. so it was it was sad and i just thought there's there's got to be a better way or or there's definitely a market for more places to submit i mean if anything there's there's a market there for people to say yes and, and we didn't say yes to everybody we turned down quite a few so very good yeah yeah, so I'm excited, but I'm also excited to move on because I have a TV show I'm working on. I have books to write. Mm-hmm. I have a children's book to get out. And then I get back to Stella. <laughs> this is why I want to get done my whip because I've, like I said, I've got like 26 other projects on my list that I, I'm, I'm itching to get writing because I've got another epic fantasy novel that I have actually drafted. It like a, it's a full book but it needs a lot of revision. So I want to, and it's like 120,000 words. So I need to get in and start chopping that up and adding and patching that up and getting that ready to to submit to beta readers. And then I've got, um, I've got a fountain of youth story I'm working on. I've got a, uh, an insurance policy story I'm working on about a devil sort of character who gives insurance policies that, grants immortality but there are, if if the character is killed in a specific way then the policy transfers to another per- like it, it's a whole idea but like these are things that are sitting on the side waiting for me to pick them back up because i can't be bothered to finish my main whip yet yeah yeah i'm just busy with with other projects that, and i can't wait i can't like i said I sit down with my rough drafts or my revisions and, and I, I just can't wait to get back to that. I, I need to finish other projects, but yeah, it's crazy. It's a weird writing world out there. But I wouldn't have yeah. it any other way. I agree. I agree. I wouldn't either. I agree. Well, thank you for your time. Thanks again for being a part of this. Um, um, unless something happens we're still set for june 2nd release like i said we're waiting for our proofs and we're just hearing things that they're delayed but it's only the 18th and so we have what two weeks so that's plenty of time well thank you for having me i uh had a great time it was great chatting with you and i'm like i said i'm excited to see what the finished product looks like and i'm sure it'll be great yeah yeah i'm excited too thanks for being here and it was nice to talk to you i think we have known each other online for like four years and i've I've never heard your voice so that's cool (laughs) it was weird when we went to cincinnati two years ago it was uh kind of weird in a way that to meet all those people you you know these people right like yeah i i know you i i could 
I know your face. I some cases I know the voices, but it doesn't feel like you're going in meeting a bunch of strangers. It's almost like going to a family reunion kind of feel. Yeah. Like it's like, hey, it's nice to see you again. You know, how have you been? Like, I I don't know. It it was it floored me a little bit when I actually got down there and actually met a lot of people that I knew only through a wireless connection. You know what I mean? Yeah. Did anybody surprise you? You don't have to name names, but but were you like, whoa, I completely like pictured you from your online persona to be this way and you're really this way. No, I don't think it I don't think there was You were very comfortable much. with everybody. Yeah. Uh the, the our guest speakers were actually phenomenal. Like they yeah. were like I know in some cases when you get sort of well known, famous, uh whether they're authors or actors or whatever they've got this aloofness to them. Uh, but mm -hmm. the people that we had, like James Scott Bell and Donald Moss and uh, Janice already, they were, it's, it, it's like having a conversation with your next door neighbor. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was so comfortable. Like we, like, it, it was nothing like my Brandon Sanderson experience. I know that much. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So for those watching, he's talking about the 10 minute novelist, um, I was going to say convention, conference. Uh, and you guys are planning another one for 2021 or 2022? Uh, yes, we have right now the dates are July 15th to 17th, uh, 2021. Uh, caveat being whatever happens with this pandemic thing. Um, right now I'm seeing a lot of things in my neck of the woods being canceled right into the fall. Uh, I hope and pray that there is some solution by the time next July rolls around so that we can yeah. go full steam ahead. But and it's I, in Cincinnati again, right? Yeah, we're having it the same place. Hopefully same. it'll run last, last time there was uh, some construction going on at the hotel. So there were, we ran into a few bugs, not, not uncommon for running a, for a first time live event, but we're hoping this time it'll be a little, uh, a little more smooth and, yeah, we're looking forward to it. But like I said, uh, I don't want to make promises I can't keep because nobody knows. Yeah, we don't know on. what's what's going to happen in the world. What I don't know, you know, like what what's winter going to bring? Yeah. Yeah. But that's a, it's a year out. It's more than a year out. So for for yeah. those again interested, ten minute novelist. Um, I believe Catherine's website is ten minute novelist dot com, right? And then yeah. um, ten minute novelist on um, Facebook is is a fantastic group. I have been a part of that group since. I want to say 2014, maybe 2015. Um, and they were, the connections that I made there, including you, were phenomenal early yeah. on. Really? I'm not as active now just because I'm really busy, but it's a fantastic group of people. I will tell you something, and this is not uh, exaggeration or uh, anything like that. Uh, I'm published today because of that group. Yeah. And I, awesome. I just... The, the the people that I've met, like you said, the connections that I've made, including yourself and Catherine and the other the other group, the other members, um, they changed my writing. They really did. The, the feedback and the confidence that they've given me since I've joined there, uh, it's, it's night and day. Like, uh, yeah, I can't say enough good things about 10-minute novels. Yeah, that's awesome. I, there, there are a lot of groups out there that are um, really amazing. Uh, indie author group, I think, is one that I started with. And then when I found Catherine's group, I really stayed with Catherine's group with 10 Minute Novelist um, for a lot of years until I just got really, really busy and went back to school. And now I'm I'm working and writing all over the place that and I said earlier when I'm on Facebook, it's it's I'm working and I have very little time to to engage in other places or in other ways. But um, it's a, it's a great, it's a great group. Um, I've met Ian, Ian has been, Ian lives in England. He has been to my house here in Arizona twice. He is a riot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I mean, there are, these are lifetime connections and friendships and mentors and, um, it's a great group. So that's exciting that, that they're doing another conference. So I hope it goes well in 2021. We'll, we'll see what happens, but I hope it happens in July of 2021. Yeah. yeah. All right, man. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate Sorry, it. So you lagged a bit. There. Can you still hear me? Oh, I, I just said thank you for your time. Is that? Uh oh, did I lose you already? <laughs> you look like you're frozen. 
Hmm. No, thank you. No, oh, no, you, yeah. now I hear you, but you I don't me? see you. Yeah, I can hear you now. Sorry. I don't know what's going on, but um, I was just saying thank you for uh, your you time. Oh, you have lost me. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, my Wi-Fi just dropped. Oh, okay. All right, I'll just wave. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for your time, Sandy.